Hi, my name is Tyler Lambert, and today we're going to be talking about dissecting Sackler malware. We'll first start this presentation by talking about some malware fundamentals, which will cover advanced persistence threats and some overarching malware terminology. Then we'll talk about the OPM and Anthem breaches and the significance behind them. Then, before we actually dive into the binary itself, we need to cover some Windows fundamentals, such as security concepts, which will cover SIDs and access tokens, and then we'll cover the Windows registry. Then we will actually get into the interesting part, which is dissecting a single sample from the Sackle of Malware family, and we will do some file analysis, behavioral analysis, and dynamic code analysis on this sample. An advanced persistence threat, otherwise known as an APT, is a stealthy and continuous hacking process, usually targeting large businesses, contractors, or government entities. The goal of an APT is to usually monitor activity or steal data rather than cause damage to the network. This isn't always true. There are a few edge cases, but this is a good rule of thumb to have. To gain initial access to these networks, they usually use sophisticated t techniques like zero days in order to, to get initial access, and then once they get access, they start monitoring, monitoring and extracting information. There are some infamous APT groups, uh, for example, Lazarus Group, which stole $81 million in a bank heist, and that was attributed to North Korea. Then there's the Shadow Brokers, who did WannaCry, and they spread that using a stolen NSA zero day, and no one has really been attributed to that yet because no one knows who they are. And then there's Fancy Bear, who is responsible for the DNC hacks, and that was attributed to Russia's GRU, which is their military intelligence branch, similar to the United States' DIA. Some basic malware terminology that we need to know for this, for this presentation. Uh, a RAT, or a remote administration tool, is just software that gives a person full remote control of a device. This doesn't have to be malicious. For example, SSH, Remote Desktop, and TeamViewer allow me to access computers remotely, but unless I'm doing that to computers I do not own, then it's not that big of a deal. But in our scenario here, we're going to be looking at RATs that we don't want that are malicious. The Command and Control, otherwise known as a C2, is a server that communicates with the compromised devices. And Sakula is a rat used by the Chinese APT nicknamed Deep Panda during the OPM and Anthem hacks. So OPM is the Office of Personnel Management. They manage all the healthcare, retirement, and most, more importantly, security clearances for all the US government and civilian workforce. While Anthem is a healthcare provider in the Blue Cross Blue Shield network, and they provide health insurance for the US government employees. The OPM breach resulted in a loss of 4.2 million personnel files from former or current government employees, but more importantly, they lost 21.5 million security clearance background investigations. This is significant because these investigations include drug history, criminal history, gambling habits, financial status, and marital status of people who have access to sensitive information. Anthem, on the other hand, lost 78.8 million unique user records. None of these records included included any medical records, which is probably what the adversaries were going for, but instead they got date of birth, social security number, address, phone number, and employment information. Sakula was the rat used in both of these attacks, but they're actually more related than you would think. The VP of Booz Allen Hamilton wrote a blog post that said if you took the people from the OPM breach and then looked at their medical records inside of Anthem, if they actually hypothetically did get the medical records, you could find people that have family members that are going through a bunch of medical trauma and try to use that to leverage them in order to, be, to make them become an asset. And all of this is really important because China was the one responsible for this and they need assets in the United States. And when you have all of this background information, such as the drug history, criminal history, gambling habits, um, you can use that to blackmail people. Um, and then there's also the financial, uh, the financial issues, like if they've declared bankruptcy, um, that you could end up bribing people to give them to give adversaries uh, classified information. So Deng Feng Cheng was a former Boeing engineer, but more importantly, he worked for the Chinese government as an asset for 30 years while he was contracting. They got him to become an asset by pulling on some heartstrings saying that they need to help out the homeland, and he did so by supplying them with 300,000 300, pages of sensitive information. And this information could have been found on the SF-86, which is the paperwork that you fill out when 
applying for a security clearance. And there's a snippet at the top that shows where you put your place of birth. Um, also, this information could probably have been found in the Anthem breaches as well. But I'm just trying to show how important that the, these documents could be and uh, how, sen how much sensitive information it could hold. Another example, we have David Boone, who's a senior cryptologic tra traffic analyst for the NSA. He was divorced, lost custody of his children, and then lost a whole bunch of money fighting in court for his to get his children back. And this financial instability caused him to be susceptible to be an asset for the, the uh, Soviet Union. And so he sold documents to them describing U.S. reconnaissance programs and gave them a list of nuclear targets in the Soviet Union for, in current dollars, 123 thousand uh, dollars when you adjust for inflation and we know that it was a finance issue because when the fbi questioned him his excuse was and i quote i needed money plus well i was extremely angry and all of this financial information is included in the sf-86 and i included a, a screenshot from the paperwork on the top uh the, it's the top image so this story of sakula isn't all doom and gloom there was a little bit of justice when they arrested yu ping yang Around this time last year, when he was trying to attend a conference inside of the United States, this is the same way that the FBI got Marcus Hutchins, who was involved in stopping the WannaCry ransomware. And if you don't know his story, I really encourage you to Google it. It's kind of ridiculous. And the image below is a screenshot of the charges, which explicitly tie him to Sakula. And the image to the right is a picture of him from his CV. So before we get into the actual binary itself, we need to cover some Windows fundamentals. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the Windows registry, which is just a collection of configuration information on installed software, hardware devices, user preferences, and OS configurations. The one that we're going to be focused on for this binary is the software Microsoft current Windows current version run key. This key specifies a whole bunch of values that are executed whenever a user logs onto a system. So when a, and so the screenshot below shows the, the run key for one of my malware boxes that says I'm going to start Chromium, Discord, OneDrive, Spotify, and Steam whenever the user logs in. And it gives the, the parameters that the programs will start with. This is one of the most basic malware persistency mechanisms because it's literally built into to Windows. Now, security identifiers, also known as SIDs, are unique numbers that are associated to users or groups. The unique numbers actually do have some meaning, uh, such as revision level, identifier authority value, domain identifier, and relative identifier. And when a user logs in to a Windows system, they it generates a user access token, and this token lists the user's SID, the SIDs of all of the groups that the user is a part of, then list of privileges and other access information. So when an, a user tries to access a securable object, it will take, such as a, a, a folder, which I have on the right, I have the temp directory, it will apply this access token and look at the user SIDs, the group SIDs, and the list of privileges in order to determine what operations can be done on the securable object. So now we're going to get to the, something that's a little bit more interesting, which is the file analysis. And the whole point of the file analysis is to infer behavior by looking at strings and imports, or uh, we're going to look at the compile time. And the compile time can actually give you some interesting information. If you see that it was compiled two years ago, then I immediately I would say, one, this by this malware was probably used somewhere else this is old or two it would lead me to, to question why was this malware developed and then not released immediately were they waiting for an event were they was were they sitting there trying to figure out how to target something it just raises some important questions and then also during the file analysis we will extract certificates which if they are present which in this case they're this binary they won't be and it'll help you decrypt traffic going to and from the C2 server. So first we're going to check our sample and virus total. And there's the SHA-256 hash for if anyone has access to virus total and wants to follow along the presentation with the actual binary. 
Um, the, the file name is mediacenter.exe, and we see that 47 out of 57 antivirus engines have determined that it is malicious, which makes sense uh, because this is actually sackable of malware. I encourage you guys to look at Virus Total and play around with some of the tools because there's all sorts of great information. But when I was doing this, I was approaching it as if I've never seen this before, that no one has ever seen this, no one's ever detected this, so I didn't want to really cheat. Before I actually ran the malware, I wanted to double check that it was in fact a Windows binary. So I did the most inefficient way possible by opening it inside of a hex editor, but I'm doing this to kind of show you how the file is broken down. And this should be able to help with CTFs, especially the forensics challenges. So the first thing we're gonna look at is this tiny little program that's added in the front of the binary, which is a DOS program. And the MZ in the ASCII decoded text didn't, is the magic number for a DOS program. And these, these DOS programs were executed by Windows operating systems that use DOS mode. So those are Windows OS's from 1995 to around 2000. And this is a backwards compatibility thing. So if you try to execute our modern binaries in DOS mode, it'll execute this tiny program and output, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. Next, we have the rich signature, and this information is linker information that the Visual C++ linker puts into the binary. And this tells me that one, it's not a .NET binary, and two, it, isn't a D it is not a DLL. And the last one is the PE magic number, for, uh, which stands for Portable Executable. And this is the actual file format that we'll, we will be executing that lists all of our segments. So we don't always have to do this, especially when we have a binary. Um, we have better tools that make things way easier and give us more information than I'd ever be willing to actually convert from hex. And CFF Explorer is a great tool. It gives us things like the machine architecture, which in our case is x86, the compile time since the Unix epoch time, which is January 1st, uh, 1970. So this binary was compiled Tuesday, February 5th, 2013 at 4.03 a.m. It also gives us sec sections and imports. And there's another tool called PE Explorer, which is pretty much the same thing. I'm just trying to give you a variety of tools and options to use. A really important thing here is under subsystems, we see that this is a Win32 GUI application. And this means to me that when I load it into IDA, I need to look for the Win main function because Win32 GUI applications start at Win main as opposed to console applications, which start at just main. And Inside of this tool, we also see in the resource section that there is a DAT resource type with 101 and 102 resources. So keep in mind, keep this in mind because later we are going to return to this and talk more about it. And finally, we get to actually do some more interesting analysis. I, I loaded the binary up into IDA and went to the strings section and all of these strings were right next to each other and they kind of gave me a lot of insight as to what possibilities this malware is doing and like how it works. And I made some estimated guesses and it almost tells me a story. So I'm gonna walk you through what I was thinking when I saw these strings. So first, iExplorer. That is the process name for Internet Explorer, which made me believe that we're going to be using Internet Explorer to communicate to the C2 server. And then we see HTTP 1.1 and POST, which are URL or HTTP request headers. So that's probably when we're going to phone home to the C2 server for the first time, we're probably going to post some sort of identifiable information. Then we have our software Microsoft Windows current version run key, and that tells me that we're probably using the run key as a persistency mechanism. And then we have a terminal or cmd.exe, which is the Windows terminal, and then a string saying create child cmd.exe process succeeded, and then it prints out the PID. This is telling me that we're probably going to be executing some sort of commands, I, I'm assuming from the C2 server, in a subprocess of terminal. Then we have command.exe slash c run dll32, and this slash c says carry out a command, and then once you're done with it, terminate the process, so it'll close out of the uh, cmd.exe. And the uh, run dll32 is a program that takes DLLs and executes the exported functions from them. 
and we don't really know what it's going to be executing yet because we have this percent %s. So I was wondering in our string section, what DLLs we actually have. And so we have uh, user 32, kernel 32, advanced API 32, shell 32, and win inet. User 32.dll contains the Windows API functions for handling your know, basic UI and Windows. Um, then we have kernel 32, which interfaces with the kernel, so it handles memory management, IO, and interrupts. This isn't very interesting to us because almost all Windows binaries will have this. Then we have the ADV API, otherwise known as the Advanced API, because Microsoft loves their acronyms and, or not acronyms, their abbreviations. And this is responsible for restarting, shutting down the system, Windows registry calls, managing user accounts, and starting, stopping Windows services, which is very interesting to us. Then we have Shell32, which contains all uh, the Shell API functions, such as is user and admin, path file exist, create sh create directory, which is kind of interesting to us. But most importantly, we have WinINet, which has various functions for your FTP and HTTP. And this is really interesting because this is probably, this, this means that this binary is going to connect to the internet in some way. And I found these strings just by filtering for a .dll. And finally, the last string that we're gonna look at is the slash C ping local host and then delete. So this is an old school batch file trick in order to delete a file after it runs. And so this, this is a self deletion technique. So when a program is running, it cannot delete itself. But if you run another program from that program and then call the delete to delete itself, it should delete itself uh, and, and kind of bypass that rule. I don't know how it works on a Windows scheduling level because I'm by no means a Windows expert, but according to my Google Foo, that is the correct answer. Now we'll start the behavioral analysis of the malware, which is where we run the malware inside of a virtual machine, take a snapshot of the state of the machine before we run it and the snapshot after we run it, and then compare what actually changed throughout the system. We're going to use Microsoft Network Monitor or Wireshark normally, but in this presentation, I needed to, to remove some things because this is a rather long presentation. So I decided just to remove this, but normally you would monitor the network traffic and see what the binary is trying to connect to and how it's trying to connect to the C2. Uh, then we're also, we are going to use RegShot, which will take a snapshot of the registry before we execute it. Then we'll run the, the malware and then look at, uh, take another snapshot of the registry afterwards and then compare the two. And then we'll use Sys Internals Process Monitor, uh, also known as Procmon which will monitor the registry modifications, the file system processes, and threat activity throughout the execution of the, the malware. So first we're gonna start with RegShot. And you see the, on the furthest picture, we'll take the first snapshot, then we execute the binary, then we click second shot or snapshot, which will take the, set, the after snapshot of the registry and then we'll click compare and we'll compare the two snapshots of the registry and will give us an output, a text output like this. And it gave us, gives us everything such as keys added, values added, and it has value, values modified, which I omitted because the most important thing that we're looking for here is the run key. So we see that micromedia was added to the run key and the path was set to the temp directory with the micromedia subdirectory and then mediacenter.exe. This is important because our binary that we are executing from my desktop is called mediacenter.exe. And we're kind of wondering how the mediacenter.exe binary got to the temp directory. Is that the same thing? Did it copy itself? Did, or is it writing a completely different file called mediacenter.exe to try to throw us off to that location? So that's something that we have to just keep in the backs of our minds while we, we go through this process. So now we're gonna do process monitor or procmon and you just hit control e or capture event and then actually execute the malware so i did that and then i filtered by the process name of mediacenter.exe and we can see information such as process start thread create load image and all of the the operations on the registry and i filtered one more time by saying okay i want to look at all of the processes that it creates from the mediacenter 
command.exe process, and we see inside the details that we have command.exe slash c run dll32 and then path to the temp directory with blvfpzjt.dat, which is very, very strange. And then it calls the exported function play win32 from that dll. So this is really fishy that it's giving us this really weird name with a, a dot dat, but it's actually a DLL because it's passed to the run DLL32 as a parameter. And then below it, we see that it executes the micromedia media center.exe file, which we again, don't know if that's the same thing that we were executing from our desktop. And then below it, we see it run again in the temp directory, some random eight characters dot dat, and then it calls play win 32 again. And then finally we see the, the ping local host and self deletion, which removes the, the binary from our system. So when I actually, when I actually run the, the malware from my desktop, it just deletes itself and it disappeared. So, then I was like, I should probably find out what these random eight characters dot dat calling play win 32, uh, these, these DLLs are. So I opened up the temp directory and of course they're gone. So then I filtered even more and added set disposition inform information file as one of the filters and it showed me nothing. So I don't know how these files are deleted which is why I just need to keep that logged in the back of my mind that they are deleted, but I don't know how yet. So this brings us to our dynamic code analysis, and this will answer all of our questions that we had from our, from our uh, static analysis, our static file analysis, and our behavioral analysis. So we're gonna use IDA Pro with a local Win32 debugger, and the process is gonna be find Win main and set a breakpoint, and then just step through the binary to see how it acts. And we're going to try to answer the questions that we came up with, such as, what are those two files, those dat files? Where did they come from? Where did they go? And what is micromedia inside of that temp directory? Is that just copied from our desktop? Or is that some completely different file that the malware either pulls from the C2 or, or that tries to actually uh, extract from itself? And, and we'll see, but we need, we, these are the questions that we need to answer throughout the dynamic code analysis. So the first thing I did, I loaded up an IDA and then I went to the functions pane and I searched for main hoping to find win main. But instead, of course, nothing's ever easy. I didn't find it, but I do see this T main CRT startup. So the underscore underscore is denotes that it's in the global namespace. And so this makes me think that this is a Windows API function uh, and it's and since it is a startup function uh, and especially CRT is the C runtime and it's a startup function, kind of reminds me of the elf files gmon start for when you use glibc and that it kind of creates it, it it gets the environment ready for you in order to call win main so i said okay well this is probably all like all the startups are probably going to eventually lead to win main so i just jumped to the function and this is what it looks like on the left when you first get into the function and on the right is the entire flow control graph of the function so after scrolling for about 30 seconds in this code block here, I found the win main function, which was great. So we just jumped to that. And this is what it looks like. The win main function only calls two functions and that is it. So I set a breakpoint on the first function and then went to debugger start process. And it brings us to starts uh, the process and then halts at the very first function call. And this IDA is great because it gives us multiple hex views so we can see and monitor uh, data as the file gets executed. It gives us the registers view. It gives us an interactive console. If you use IDA Python with it, it gives us the current stack and of course the disassembly view. So we're gonna step into this first function that WinMain has and immediately we see some mem sets and then it calls this sub 1152890. So let's step into that function. It immediately calls is user and admin. And this is a very interesting call because according to some of my Google searches, this was deprecated, but not in a very backwards compatible like way, which is unlike Microsoft, where when you called is users and admin on certain operating system versions, it always returned false because they were trying to deprecate it. 
But now if you look at the current MSDN pages, it's actually just a wrapper for the check token membership and it creates a, a hard-coded admin SID and then passes it to the check token membership, which is effectively doing the same thing as is user and admin. So it calls is user and admin and if it is an admin, it just returns one, but if not, it calls git version A, which populates a structure of the Windows operating system major, minor, and release name numbers. And it then checks right here. The first arrow shows it checking if it is the major number six. If so, it goes to the left and then it loads in the minor number from the struct. And if it's non-zero, it goes to the right. And then it checks if it's one, it'll go to the left. And it and I'm gonna spare you the, the gory details of this, but it just checks if the the operating system running is Windows 7 or Windows Server 2008 R2. And if so, it'll continue down the path and call open process token and then get token information. So this will get all the information from our current user's access token. And then afterwards, it calls allocate and initialize SID what's the sub authorities 32 and 544. And these are the built-in administrators uh, SID. So it says, I'm gonna generate a, a admin SID and then I have the, uh, the entire access token from our current process. And it's going to iterate through our access token calling equal SID to see if any of the SIDs in our access token is equal to this admin SID that we just generated. And then if so, it returns one. So just as a quick recap, we first called is user an admin to check if the user was an admin, and if so, it would return one. But like I said earlier, it is deprecated in certain versions, such as Windows 7 and Windows 7 or Windows 2008 R2, uh, server R2, um, where it would always return false. So instead of, of relying on that is user an admin, it actually grabbed the current access token and then iterated through it checking if any of the SIDs in the access token were the admin SID. So now if we did return one and we, we, we are an admin, it's gonna call get tick count and get tick count returns the number of milliseconds that have elapsed since the system was started. And then it's gonna do this weird algorithm where it delete, where it divides by hex one A and then adds hex six one to it, which generates random characters and it iterates eight times. So when I saw this iterating eight times, I immediately thought back to those two files that we saw, which had eight characters of random ASCII text and then dot dat. So I was wondering if this was the file generation for that, which we will see later. So this is just an assumption I'm making currently. Then we see it called find resource A, which loads a resource from the resource section of the PE file. And it uses the resource type dat and resource name 101, which we see passed into find resource A. And we saw that back when we were looking at our PE Explorer, uh, and I have a quick screenshot of on the left of that. So once it loads it, it calls XOR, or it iterates through each byte. It checks if it's equal to hex 24, and if it is, then it just skips it. But if it's not, it it XORs it by 24. So I let it execute this entire decoding routine, and then I open it up in a PE file or a hex editor, and we see the DOS header at the top with that MZ magic number, and then the PE magic number for a portable executable. Notice that we don't have a rich signature, so this is denoting to me that this is probably a DLL, which makes sense because we had some random DLL getting called that wasn't in our system, so it probably was some sort of self-extraction, and that's these are the assumptions that I'm making currently. So then it iterates byte by byte through this extracted and decoded resource, and it checks if it finds hex 1EA characters. And then if it does find these characters, it, it copies the path to the current executing binary, which in our case is mediacenter.exe from my current from my user's desktop, and then it, it writes it to that A padding. And this is like a poor man's IPC mechanism where when this binary was created, it had a hard-coded string value that says, like, let's call it a whole bunch of A's. And when the malware is going to get called, it's going to look at the string variable name, whole bunch of A's. But it's not actually a whole bunch of A's because before it was called, it, we added the path to the current uh, executing binary to it. 
so that it knows where, where, where it is. So this is passing the information to this DLL for when it gets called. And then finally we call create file and write file and we see that it writes to the temp directory with those eight random characters and it appends dot dat to it. So that did confirm our initial assumptions from a couple slides ago. And then afterwards it run it does the command.exe run dll32 and it executes that file that we just decoded for, and wrote to our temp directory and that calls the exported function play win32. So I know that was a lot that we just went over, so I just need to give a quick recap of what we just looked at. First, the binary checks that the user is an administrator by calling is user an admin. And then it's if it returns false, it then checks if it's Windows 7 or Windows Server 2008 R2, because those versions deprecated is user an admin to return always false. And then it, it if it is Windows 7 or Windows Server 2000 R2, it gets the access token, generates a admin SID, and then it iterates through the access token and checks if the the admin SID is inside of the user's access token. And then if it does find the admins, uh, the admins SID inside of our access token, then it returns one saying, yes, we are an administrator. So if we are an administrator from either of those two, mecha the, those two checking methods, it creates a file or it, it loads a resource file um, from the dat, that dat 101 file, and it XORs it with hex 24, I believe it was, and then it writes the file to our temp directory and then calls command.exe run dll32 uh, and then our temp directory with that decoded resource file that is actually a DLL and then calls the exported function play win32. So then I loaded the DLL inside of IDA and I immediately went to the string section and I found our path to our current executing binary, which is the media center in, our, in my user's desktop folder, and then a whole bunch of trailing A's. So I looked at what it looked like inside of the, the actual data section of the file. And immediately below that, I saw elevation colon administrator exclamation point new, and then some long number looking like a SID. So I was really curious as to why they would hard code such a unique string. So I Googled it and it's actually a UAC bypass exploit and UAC is a user access control. And so it just limits what software privileges, what privileges software has, and it, it must notify the user if certain changes are going to be made. So it, it, you see that you see these pop-ups when you try to install software or drivers or changing system wide settings or viewing other user viewing or changing other user accounts or running administrative tools, you will see this pop-up here. And the whole point of that exploit is to bypass this pop-up from coming up if you're an admin, because we don't want our malware to say program name media center.exe publisher unknown, file origins uh, hard drive on there, uh, you know, wants to make changes to the computer because the whole point is to be unnoticeable, like it's pretty noticeable. So after it executes this UAC uh, bypass exploit, it then calls the self deletion. And this answers our question earlier about what happens to these random dat files that are actually DLLs. Um, they do do that, that ping self deletion. And I realized that I made a mistake when I was doing the behavioral analysis and I did not remove the filter for the process name, so I left it just as mediacenter.exe, not thinking that they would actually do self-deletion. And this is why the actual dynamic analysis is important because we need to know how to step through this so that we don't run into issues like that where I make some sort of assumption and I have absolutely no way of checking it. This is why it's such an important skill to be able to step through this. So after this, we're going to return back to the mediacenter.exe binary and that first function that we called after the, the mem sets is just checking the if it's an administrator. And then if it is an administrator, it's doing the UAC by, bypass exploit by writing that DLL to the temp directory and then executing it. So now we're going to continue further down. And re remember, we are in the first function that win main calls uh, after all the mem sets. Then it does the UAC bypass admin uh, check like the UAC 
bypass uh, exploit if it could, if it, if it is an admin, then we're going to continue on further. And we're going to see there's a whole bunch of XORs and it does that same sort of algorithm that we saw where it says, if this byte is an is a hex five six we're going to skip it but if not we're going to export by hex five six and it's doing this from some pointer in the data section and it'll do it'll xor six times and on the image on the right we see that it's adding six to ea eax eax is our counter of how many times um we have xored and then it compares it to hex 9d8 which is 2520 bytes so that's how much it iterates doing this XOR before it actually um, decodes everything. So I ran a quick Python script to check that it, I did understand this completely and I, I copied some of the strings from the the data section and ran it in the, in Python and I saw www.polarroot.com slash photo, uh, new image, view photo, image ID, and media center.exe, which is really important because one, polarroot.com is probably going to be our C2 server. Um, and two, that I know for a fact that it is decoding what I now believe is my string section, or not string section, but a whole bunch of strings from my data section. So instead of sitting there and just copy pasting everything into my Python script, I actually wrote a, uh, made a breakpoint at the end of this whole XORing routine and I just hit continue until return. And then I checked the string section in IDA and it gave us all sorts of great strings, including www.northpolroot.com, which is probably a backup C2 server. So if the feds take down polaroot.com or the, the service that actually hosts that takes it down because it's known to be malicious, then, um, then we have a backup to continue the attack through. Um, and we find all sorts of great strings. The last one was emitted because it was the um, the attack name, and it, it's, the attack name was actually the name of the company that this campaign was used against. And since I've seen in other malware write-ups that people emit these things, if they ever try to find any sort of um, identifiable, identifiable information, such as like users that they were targeting or companies that, that you should redact it. So I, that's I felt like I should redact it as well. So after this strings decoding, this section is rather boring. So I'm going to try to abstract away from it as much as possible to save you the gory details. But percent temp percent is the temp directory. And when you evaluate this, it, this directory, it's this uh, expression. It says to the Windows operating system, check your system environment variables and find the value that's associated with temp. And that's going to be your temp directory then we're going to add micromedia to it and then inside and then add uh, mediacenter.exe to it. So it creates this path to the temp directory, micromedia, mediacenter.exe, and then it gets the full path to the current executable process uh, path. So for us, that is, you know, user Tyler, uh, desktop, uh, mediacenter.exe, and it compares the two paths. If the paths are the same, meaning that we are, our current executing path is inside the temp directory, with the subdirectory micromedia, then it returns back to win main and it's going to call that second function in win, in win main. But if it's not, we're going to create the directory in our local temp called micromedia, and then it copies the media center.exe binary to the micromedia uh, folder inside of the temp directory. And this answers that initial question of where does this media center.exe binary come from? It literally just copies itself over. Then at line 18312C, it checks if we have admin privileges. If we do, we add the path that we just created from that copied binary to the run key of the local machine. And this is important because the local machine requires admin access. And the local machine means if any user logs onto the system, it's going to execute the malware. Um, but if it's not a, an admin, it's going to execute the current, it's going to add it to the current user's run key, which doesn't need admin privileges, but if another user logs onto the computer, it's not going to execute the malware. So then we see it actually writing the micromedia key with the path to our temp directory micromedia media center.exe, and then we're actually ex uh, executing that path. And then finally, doing the self deletion. So, like we said, this is how the binary disappears from my desktop when I actually run it. 
So a quick recap of the boring section. Uh, it, it checks if our current executing process, the path to it is coming from the temp directory slash micromedia slash media center exe. And then if it is, it returns back to WinMain. If not, it creates that directory. It copies the wherever the media center dot exe binary is into that directory. And then it adds the path, that temp directory path, that, you know, temp uh, media center or uh, micromedia media center dot exe to the registry, the startup registry key. And depending if we're admin or not, it'll add it to the local machine or the current user and then executes the media center binary inside of the temp directory and then self deletes the one from the desktop. So now we're gonna change our plans a little bit and we copy the micromedia exe into our temp directory so that we actually reach the second function call inside of our win main. And I put a breakpoint there. I started it, stepped inside, and I see that it, it first checks if we're gonna wait, if we're gonna sleep for one minute and then if not, it calls this sub one two C one four two zero. So we'll step inside and see that it calls uh, get computer name A. So the machine name on my virtual box machine is Tyler PC. So then after that, it does this weird encoding routine or hashing. I'm not even sure what to call it. Um, and so I, I converted it to Python just to see if I knew what it was doing because this is more makes more sense I'm um, showing you guys then uh, going through the assembly. So it takes each character, it takes the mod of, of uh, hex 1a, and then it adds hex 6.1 to it. And so this weird hashing algorithm creates um, 6.7, 6c, 79, 72, 6.5, 7.4, 6.3, 7.0. And I ran the binary and I checked that it did work. So now I, I know for a fact that it does work the way I think it works. And the ASCII for that is L Y R E T C P. So then after it does that weird hashing of the machine name, it calls get volume information. And this gets the hard, the, your hard drive serial number, which is assigned when you actually format your hard disk. And then it converts it into a 32 bit signed string. So then it takes the, that weird hashed machine name, which was so my Tyler PC, uh, and then the, signed 32-bit um, string representation and it combines them after the photo param that we see at the top and it uses these two parameters to identify a single machine because this malware campaign uh, compromised 100 million devices so we need to know how the c2 can can differentiate each other so we need to find some sort of way to do that and what better way to do that than using the machine name tied with the hard drive serial number so then it calls uh, internet open a so it uses it says we're going to use uh, internet explorer in order to do our web communication then it calls get username a which for me the username is tyler which is capital t lowercase y l e r and then it calls get tick count and instead of using the get tick count to generate those eight characters for the dat files which are actually dll files we're going to use this as a session identifier for our communication to the c2 server so when I send this URL to the C2 server, you know, asking it for something like saying, oh, I need some file or I'm waiting some sort of command. When the C2 server sends its information back to our malware, it'll be using that res ID that uh, that was initially sent. And so that the malware goes, oh, okay, that's the response as to the command that I queued at one time. Then we also have a type ID inside of that URL and that specifies the command that it's actually executing and there's eight separate commands which we'll get into in a minute um, all of them doing slightly separate or slightly different things and then it calls internet connect and then open the the uh, http open request use it passing our post in http 1.1 and this is the initial like c2 phone home so we we were right when we saw that static we were doing static analysis that it uses internet explorer and uh, http to post the initial connection saying, hey, look, I'm infected here. What do you want me to do to the C2 server? So now we're gonna start looking at some of those command numbers uh, from the type uh, in the as the parameter, and there's eight different ones. Um, I, I, I'm gonna just show you some of the, the interesting ones just for time's sake. So command number two 
drops a file to the temp directory with that random file name based off of the tick count. So we can see that it calls create file, set file pointer to the beginning, and then write file. And uh, sorry, then we have, sorry, command number three, which does the exact opposite, which sends a file to the C2 server. So we see it calling create file a, and that's checking if the file exists. And then it calls set file pointer to the beginning, and then it calls get file size. And then we start reading the file. But the weird thing that threw me off is the number of bytes to read is hex 19,000, and that's a hard-coded value. And at first, I didn't really understand why this, how this exactly worked. So I had to cheat, and I looked at Airbus Cyber's write-up on this malware, and I, I found what, what command number three did. And what it does is when it reads the file, it reads the file in chunks, and it sends in, in, in small chunks in this sprintf here, where it's percent %d of percent %d for percent %s on percent %s is just a log statement that says, you know, I'm sending the first 1900, uh, sorry, 19,000 hex bytes of the file, and it's, you know, uh, chunk 0 of 2, 1 of 2, and 2 of 2, and then it gives you the path and then the machine name as it's actually executing. And this totally makes sense when you think about it, because if I have a database that I'm trying to exfiltrate to my C2 server, I'm not going to put that all inside of an HTTP request or not uh, an HTTP message because I don't even think the HTTP messages can handle that big of data. Like I, I bet you that when it's like hundreds of gigs that the, that the request is, the protocol is going to limit it somehow. But also I don't want it to be noticed by network admins when they see heavy internet uh, traffic flow and then being like, oh my gosh, what is this data? And then you look at it and it's like, oh, the data is our database. This is, we're under attack, and then they pull all cords, cut all connections. So command number four is really simple. It just executes whatever is specified in the C2 response. Command number six is interesting because it uh, opens our micromedia key and then deletes it. And after it deletes it, it does that ping self-deletion. So this is the the remove malware command. So if I, if I get all the information I want from our current system, I don't want to leave the malware there because it's more susceptible to being found later. So then I will run, I will, the C2 server will say, I'm done with you, it sends this command number six, which will tell it to, to delete itself. And finally, we have command number eight, which creates a reverse shell by piping to a sub process. And this is where we see that string saying, uh, oh, successfully created child command.exe with uh, PID, uh, whatever the number is it's while it's creating a reverse shell to the system. So now we understand how the malware actually works. And now we need to talk about how you stop an ongoing attack. So the first thing you wanna do is shut down the C2 server. Um, I've heard that some cloud services will actually just terminate the, the server if it's known to be a C2. But in other instances, you might have to have the FBI get a warrant and actually take control, like seize control of the server. And if they do, then they can you know log the IP addresses of the compromised devices, which is really helpful because they can say, once they attribute the attack to somebody, um, they can say, okay, well, why were they, all the IP is coming from this company or this agency, what were they trying to get and, and trying to, to reverse engineer some sort of threat intel as to what they were going, going for. And that information can be important because it can say what they were trying to, to get out of it. And then, you know, you'd say, why are you trying, why are they trying to get this information? Um, then also you can, if you get the IP addresses, you can inform the victims that have been affected. Um, and then the, we have the malware analyst who work for an antivirus company and they want the, the goal of their antivirus is to keep the malware off of all of their customers' computers. So they'll start reverse engineering the malware and try to find certain unique sections of the binary so that when the, the antivirus scans the entire system, if it finds a certain pattern match inside of a binary, that it'll say, oh, this is definitely malware, we need to delete this now, and then inform the user. So for an example, uh, this is the Yara rule, which is the signature scanning rule for uh, SACLA version 1.3, which is what we looked at. And we see that if it says if we find the string percent %d of percent %d for percent %s on percent %s, which is our chunking log statement for when we're reading a file and sending it to the C2 server, then it says if we see the ping self-deletion command, and we see that run DLL uh, command. And then finally, if, if it matches this weird 
uh, bite signature, then this is definitely a Sakula rat um, version 1.3. We need to delete it now. So I was curious, like I, I understood where all these other strings came from, but I didn't know where this binary signature came from. So in Ida, I did a pattern scan and I found that it was at four, uh, hex 402A10. And this is our command number six self deletion command. And so it's saying that this command is in all of the Sakula version 1.3 malware binaries. And I was then thinking, well, what's so unique about this that makes this a good candidate for a, a, a signature scan? Um, and the first thing that I can, can't, I can come up with, uh, and, and mind you, this is me just making some assumptions here. I'm by no means, by no means a malware analyst. I, I don't do this professionally. This is literally just something I did for fun, and, and I had a lot of fun making this presentation. Um, it, it checks first if it's, it compares to hex 378, which is 888. Then immediately after that, it calls the open registry key, which seems rather unique, but uh, even more unique, it calls, you know, open registry key, delete key. Uh, and when it calls delete key, it pushes the offset of value name. And I know a lot of people will see this and get caught up. Um, that's actually Ida trying to make your life easier. Uh, naming the variable for you because it knows which parameters are getting passed into that registry delete key. Um, but if you look at the actual binary, under the hood of IDA, it's actually a hard-coded offset into the data section. So that's what makes this such a good candidate, is if we have all of those strings, and then we find the registry open, registry delete, with that and that certain hard-coded value, then it's pretty much for certain that we are looking at Sakula. So, uh, well, what now? Um, if you enjoyed this talk and you, you want to get more into reverse engineering malware, um, I'm gonna explain my process and how I got to the point where I could start doing this for fun. Um, and first I, I took CS262, uh, which is all about C and it teaches you pointer arithmetic and memory management. Then in CS367, you learn assembly and you learn how like the stack works and everything, which is really important to reversing uh, malware. And then uh, 465 was really helpful because it was more on assembly and then it talked about processors and how processors work and, and the pipeline of a processor, which is really important for if you start to mess with languages like uh, assembly languages like MIPS, which have branch prediction and you need to understand how to actually flush the, the processor pipeline. And then uh, CS499, which is the most directly applicable and covers exploitation and malware analysis. Um, and I just want to say, like, note that I haven't, I haven't taken any IT, cybersecurity engineering, or ISA classes, uh, like information, assurance, information security assurance here at GMU. So I haven't, I haven't taken any of those classes. So this is just in my, my little world, what's actually helped me. But you don't even need to take some of these classes. There's SANS courses if you can afford it. Then you can do self-taught by book and, and actually compiling C programs and then reversing them. Um, and even if you don't know assembly and you're like, let's say like a freshman, sophomore, and you're still getting into this, and but you're interested in malware, you don't have to look at the actual like binaries. There's plenty of malware that is written with .NET, which has a decompiler um, or PowerShell that you can actually try to, to mess with and it'll help you get uh, acquainted with the uh, Windows API. 